Art is like a mirror. The task of analyzing the nature and function of metaphor has traditionally been assigned to the rhetorician and to the critic of literature. Metaphor, however, whether alive or moribund, is an inseparable element of all discourse, including discourse whose purpose is neither persuasive nor aesthetic, but descriptive and informative. Metaphysical systems in particular are intrinsically metaphorical systems, and in a recent book, Stephen C. Pepper has made out each of the major worldviews to be a kind of prodigious synecdoche, demonstrating the whole of the universe to be like one of its parts. Even the traditional language of the natural sciences cannot claim to be totally literal, although its key terms often are not recognized to be metaphors until, in the course of time, the general adoption of a new analogy yields perspective into the nature of the old. And in the criticism of poetry, metaphor and analogy, though less conspicuous, are hardly less functional than in poetry itself. A particular aim of this book is to emphasize the role in the history of criticism of certain more or less submerged conceptual models, what we may call archetypal analogies, in helping to select, interpret, systematize, and evaluate the facts of art. While many expository analogues, as conventional opinion proposes, are causal and illustrative, some few seem recurrent and not illustrative, but constitutive. They yield the ground plan and essential structural elements of a literary theory, or of any theory. By the same token, they select and mould those facts which a theory comprehends. For facts are facta, things made as much as things found, and made in part by the analogies through which we look at the world as through a lens. I wonder, Coleridge once remarked, why facts were ever called stubborn things. Facts, you know, are not truths. They are not conclusions. They are not even premises, but in the nature and parts of premises. Any area for investigation, so long as it lacks prior concepts to give it structure and an express terminology with which it can be managed, appears to the inquiring mind inchoate, either a blank or an elusive and tantalizing confusion. Our usual recourse is, more or less deliberately, to cast about for objects which offer parallels to dimly sensed aspects of the new situation, to use the better known to elucidate the less known, to discuss the intangible in terms of the tangible. This analogical procedure seems characteristic of much intellectual enterprise. There is a deal of wisdom in the popular locution for what is its nature, namely, what's it like? We tend to describe the nature of something in similes and metaphors, and the vehicles of these recurrent figures, when analysed, often turn out to be the attributes of an implicit analogue, through which we are viewing the object we describe. And if I am right, Plato's deliberate use of analogue and parable differs from that of many other inquirers less in tactics than in candour. The recourse to a mirror, in order to illuminate the nature of one or other art, continued to be a favourite with aesthetic theorists long after Plato. In Renaissance speculation, the reference to a looking-glass is frequent and explicit. What should painting be called, asked Alberti, except the holding of a mirror up to the original as in art? Leonardo repeatedly appeals to a mirror to illustrate the relation to nature both of a painting and the mind of a painter. The mind of the painter should be like a mirror, which always takes the colour of the thing that it reflects, and which is filled by as many images as there are things placed before it. You cannot be a good master unless you have a universal power of representing by your art all the varieties of the forms which nature produces. In literature we find Caxton's Mirror of the World, Barclay's The Mirror of Minds, and Gascoigne's Glass of Government and the Steel Glass. There are mirrors of fools and mirrors for magistrates. The analogue was especially popular for comedy, the early representative of literary realism, and a great many critics, Italian and English, cited the words that Donatus, writing in the 4th century, had attributed to Cicero, that comedy is a copy of life, a mirror of custom, a reflection of truth. Thus, in answer to the question, 
quid sit comoedia, Ben Jonson puts in the mouth of the dramatic connoisseur Cordatus the alleged opinion of Cicero that it is an imitatio vitae, speculum consuetudenis imago veritatis. As late as the middle of the 18th century, important critics continued to illustrate the concept of imitation by the nature of a looking glass. Dr. Johnson was fond of this parallel, and found it the highest excellence of Shakespeare, that he holds up to his readers a faithful mirror of manners and of life. In 1751, Bishop Warburton glossed Pope's line that nature and Homer were, he found, the same. With the comment that Virgil had the prudence to contemplate nature in the place where she was seen to most advantage, collected in all her charms in the clear mirror of Homer. Rousseau based his analysis of dramatic imitation on the passage in which Plato had derived the nature of imitation from the attributes of a mirror image. Bishop Hurd introduced his extended commentary on poetry in general by citing Aristotle's definition of that art as imitation, and then had recourse to Plato's mirror to demonstrate how this imitation is performed. Again, of the endless variety of these original forms, which the poet's eye is incessantly traversing, those which take his attention most, his active mimetic faculty prompts him to convert into fair and living resemblances. This magical operation, the divine philosopher, excellently illustrates by the similitude of a mirror, which, he says, as you turn about and oppose to the surrounding world, presents you instantly with the sun, stars, and skies. In elucidating his conception of poetry in the Republic, Plato himself first referred to images in the mirror, then to the work of a painter, and finally applied the distinctions drawn from both these illustrations to define the mimetic character of poetry. The progression is significant. The mirror, as analogue for poetry, suffers from the conspicuous defect that its images are fleeting. Before the invention of photography, the product of a painter was the best available instance of something which captures and retains a likeness. A picture, therefore, while itself a work of art, was a useful adjunct to the mirror for clarifying the less obvious mimetic quality of an art like poetry, which reflects the world indirectly by the significance of its words. Plutarch popularized the saying of Simonides that painting is mute poetry and poetry a speaking picture. And this, together with Horace's phrase, ut pictura poesis, taken out of context and misinterpreted as asserting a comprehensive parallelism between the two arts, became axioms in popular aesthetic wisdom. As Irving Babbitt says quite accurately, it is rare to read through a critical treatise on either art or literature, written between the middle of the 16th and middle of the 18th century, without finding an approving mention of the Horatian smile, or of the equivalent saying of Simonides. In 1758, it still seemed to Dr. Johnson that, of the parallels which have been drawn by wit and curiosity, some are literal and real, as between poetry and painting, which differ only as the one represents things by marks permanent and natural, the other by signs accidental and arbitrary. The probable effect on Renaissance and later artistic theory and practice of the elaborate comparisons between the details of a painting and of a poem has often been remarked. For our present purpose, it is enough to note that the appeal to painting corroborated the concept that poetry is a reflection of objects and events. It is difficult to gauge the extent to which the characteristic preoccupations and discoveries of aesthetic theory have been fostered by the conceptual model of the reflector. Whether this has been explicitly or covertly effective in determining the focus and terms of critical analysis. At one extreme, we have Plato's simple and obvious derivatives from the mirror as analogue. For example, a mirror image is only a simulacrum of an object, forced deceptively to represent three dimensions by two. Hence the lowly status of art as mere appearance, far removed from the truth. Also, the sole function of a mirror is to yield a flawless and accurate image. Correspondingly, when poets like Homer and Aeschylus depart from the truth of things, we have no alternative but to say that they are liars. Such criteria are sufficient for Plato's purpose, which is concerned not at all with the value of art in itself, 
but with demonstrating that freedom of the artist may not be suffered in a closed state formed on a timeless model, whether this be the perfect state of the Republic or the practically perfect state of the laws. At the other extreme, we have the poetic. The peculiar strength of Aristotle's analysis of tragedy consists in the degree to which he succeeds in developing a set of distinctions, which, if they do not entirely escape from analogy, are specifically appropriate to a poem considered as an object of its own kind, and an end in itself. Between these two poles, we have the post-Aristotelian theories, which, almost without exception, reverted to concepts of mimesis much closer to the attributes of a literal reflector. The perspective afforded by more recent conceptual schemes enables us to discriminate certain tendencies common to many of those theorists between the 16th and 18th centuries who looked upon art as imitation, and more or less like a mirror. For better or worse, the analogy helped focus interest on the subject matter of a work and its models in reality. To the comparative neglect of the shaping influence of artistic conventions, the inherent requirements of the single work of art, and the individuality of the author, it encouraged the striking of a dichotomy between those elements of a work which are demonstrably representative of the real world and those further verbal and imaginative elements, said to be merely ornamental, introduced to give greater pleasure to the reader, and it fostered a preoccupation with the truth of art or its correspondence in some fashion, to the matters it is held to reflect. The long survival of the reflector as archetype demonstrates its aptness and suggestiveness as one point of departure for aesthetic theory. The endemic disease of analogical thinking, however, is hardening of the categories. For, as Coleridge said, no simile runs on all four legs. Analogues are, by their nature, only partial parallels, and the very sharpness of focus afforded by a happily chosen archetype makes marginal and elusive those qualities of an object which fall outside its primitive categories. While a work of art, for instance, is very like a mirror, it is also, in important respects, quite different, and not many critics have been able to keep the derived aesthetic categories flexible and sufficiently responsive to data outside their immediate scope. The history of modern criticism, as we shall see, may in some part be told as the search for alternative parallels, a heterocosm or second nature, the overflow from a fountain, the music of a wind harp, a growing plant, which would avoid some of the troublesome implications of the mirror, and better comprehend those aspects and relations of an aesthetic object which this archetype leaves marginal or omits.